uh, let's introduce our first uh, finalist. So uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to Winbrook Parents and Guardians, Mr. Michael Monroe. Michael is currently serving in the role of assistant principal at the Bresnahan Elementary School in the Newburyport Public Schools, a position he has held for two years. Prior to that, he worked at the McKay School, part of the Boston Public Schools in East Boston, where he served in multiple roles, including AmeriCorps volunteer uh, for one year, elementary teacher for nine years, assistant principal and director of operations for six years. He cites student support, um, teacher efficacy, and school transformation uh, among his areas of expertise. He brings a BS in sports management from Springfield College in Springfield, Mass., and an MS in science education from the University of Miami in Miami, Florida. And just last night, he learned that he got into a doctoral program at UPenn. So congratulations on that. Yeah, let, yeah start with a clap. That's all right. Uh, so, so Michael, we're, though, right? like, you're not going like, to come here. No, yeah. no, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so Michael, we're thrilled to have you here. I want to ask you to take a few minutes to provide your own introduction to yourself, and then we'll get to the questions. I want to let you all know we did not plan questions ahead of time, because that's not how the job works. Right? So you got to just take whatever's in front of you. So part of our, part of our uh, process is to model what, what it is a principal does. And a principal meets with a community that, he, that they may or may not know, and they take whatever is being asked of them. My only request of you is that we remember how hard it can be to face a crowd you don't know with no relationship yet and answer some hard-hitting hard questions. Public education is different than other, than other uh, jobs. Sometimes you take a job, you take an interview, no one knows you're there. You either get the job or you don't, and it's all private. We announce it ahead of time. We field calls over the weekend. We give everyone your resume, and then we bring you in, in front of a crowd, and then we film it, and we post it online. And so I don't want that. That is a good thing, right? I think we're being, you know, we're, we're being inclusive. But I also don't want you to lose what it's like to be on this side of it. So please be gentle with Michael, uh, and please be respectful. Michael, it's all yours. You're going to have to raise this because you're a lot taller than I am. Can so. I, actually, can I stay over here? And yeah, just you can do whatever you need to do. Towards me? Yeah. There you go. So I'm going to ask Michael just to do a couple, a couple minutes on a little bit about you, and then we'll get to our questions. So I won't, I won't push you through. Uh, I, I tried to entertain myself with the teachers earlier. I, uh, <laughs> in my introduction, I used ChatGPT to, uh, I, I tried to train ChatGPT to really understand who I am. I felt like my first interview with them, I didn't totally give them everything I wanted to. So I played around with ChatGPT, and I you know, threw in a ton of prompts and all, my resume and cover letter and uh, a ton of other information, and it, it generated a, a, a pretty funny uh, um, elevator speech for me that I, I, is entertaining for me, but maybe not for them today. I get a couple chuckles, but um, I, you know, I'm not a narrative guy, and that was part of the reason why I did that. I'm a, I'm a doer. I'm a go-getter. I'm a I'll show you what I am type of guy. And uh, I'm super appreciative to be here. Thank you all for coming out. I'm a parent as well. My boys are at soccer practice without me right now. It's all good. Um, so I understand, you know, we are taking time out of our crazy, crazy lives to be here. Hopefully I could be as entertaining as possible to all of you. Uh, and very appreciative of opportunity. And I just really want to make sure that uh, I answer any questions that you may have. And I leave here this afternoon, uh, and you leave here this afternoon with an understanding of who I am and, and what I'm all about. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask uh, anyone who wants to raise a hand, I'm just going to ask you to raise a hand. I'll bring the microphone to you. It's really, it's not so Michael can hear you, but it's so the, the camera can pick it up. When you ask me a question, I'm just going to ask you to introduce your name and then sort of your role, if you represent the PTA or if you're a parent of a third grader or where your kids are. It's just so Michael has a sense of it. So first question. Bold, bold in the back. Here we go. Someone's got to start it all off. Um, Alex Danahy, I have a kindergartner here. She's the youngest of five kids that I have. Um, so I have a question. So how did you get interested in working with elementary school age group? What? Yeah. I, so like Mike said during his introduction, uh, I started, I graduated college. Uh, Springfield College, he, he told you that I have a master's in sports management. I really have a master's in basketball and track. Um, that was a joke, too. Just, um, but I thought I wanted to be an ath athletic director. I was, you know, I was an athlete my entire life. Uh, my father was an entrepreneur. So you know, the stars aligned. It led me to Springfield College, who had one of the, the top sports management programs, really, in the country. And... Um, 
I graduated and had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, and I knew I loved working with kids. Uh, I actually tried to switch majors my sophomore year. And my advisor told me, you're too far in, just graduate and you can do whatever you want after the, afterwards, which uh, wasn't entirely true. Uh, um, so upon graduation, I, I joined AmeriCorps. I was placed at the McKay School in East Boston. I completed 1,700 community service hours, really closing the, the achievement gap by closing the opportunity gap. I, did, I spent so much time attempting to provide opportunities that students wouldn't have had if I wasn't there. And um, incredible experience, got to know incredible people, and was uh, the following year, actually took the position of athletic director at the boys club. I grew up in Haverhill, so I was, I was hired as the athletic director at the boys club in Haverhill. Kind of a dream job at the time. Almi Abeda, who is now the superintendent in Chelsea, called me up and asked me to come in for an interview. She had an opening for a PE teacher position. And I said, Almi, I have my dream job. She said, just come in. And I never left. I taught there for, I taught there for nine years, was nominated for Boston Public School Teacher of the Year. Didn't win, but I was nominated, badge of honor. And um, just loved what I did every day. Worked in a, we, I called it a gymatorium. It was a terrible gym and it was a terrible auditorium. It was just an awful space, but we had a lot of fun in there. And took every single leadership position and opportunity that kind of was made available to me. And was asked to take over as assistant principal. You know, worked with, uh, with Jordan Weimer as his, I would say, co-principal for for six years and, and just with the staff did incredible work. So um, that's kind of my path, my journey. But if, you know, to go beyond that, I, um, I believe that every student should have a, a champion in school, right? And multiple champions in school. And, and no student should go through their educational journey not feeling, uh, not feeling awesome not feeling important, not feeling seen, valued, heard. Uh, and I don't think I had that person. So I think go, looking back to why I did AmeriCorps, why I became a teacher, kind of why I still do what I do now, if I could be that person for one student, awesome. If I could be it for 50, awesome. But I can create the conditions for those, all students to have multiple champions every single day. So you know, that on top of school was really, really tough for me. Uh, and it, it, looking back, boils down to high quality teaching and learning and, and best practices. And so I've, lo I've learned to and have grown into kind of my instructional expertise, my instructional leadership, and, uh, and have been really empowered recently from sitting and working with teachers to figure out the best possible ways that we can we can teach students so that they learn, especially at this level, the foundational skills that they need to be successful throughout their, throughout their schooling. So as a struggling student, um, I know the importance of you know, high quality teaching and, and high quality curriculum materials, high quality planning. So I, I do my best every single day to make sure teachers have what they need to do their best for students each and every day. Uh, hi, I'm McCall. I'm a kindergarten parent. Um, as we heard at the beginning, we had a fair bit of turnover in Belmont this year. So could you talk a little bit about what your plans are going forward? Yeah, I got into the doctoral program at UPenn. So um, it's not virtual, uh, but it's not full time. So it's a, it's a program that is designed for working professionals. It's a very diverse cohort of people from all over the world, actually, coming together to just you know, get, in Boston, we used to say get better at getting better, right? Just improving our practice, thinking critically, uh, building, building upon each other's knowledge so that we can come back to our own communities and do right for kids and teachers. So it's a, it's a summer program, uh, summers and weekends over the course of three years. So um, 
I was saying to Mike earlier, actually, I asked specifically, I said, is this a, is this a superintendent preparation program? And they said, no, not at all. And I said, good, because that's not necessarily what I want. I, I love what I do. Um, I also said to Mike, I said, you, you miss being in school? Because schools are awesome. I, I have the best job in the world. And, um, but I can be better. And I, if I'm better, teachers are better, and kids achieve higher standards. So I'm really excited about that learning experience, that learning opportunity. Um, I'll also say I spent 15 years in, in East Boston. Um, the first day that when I was placed at the McKay, that was the second time that I had been to East Boston in my life. Uh, I think I went to Santarpio's once, um, had some pizza at Santarpio's, and it's not the same as the pizza up on Route 1 at Santarpio's. East Boston location is way better. Um, but I, I never left. I was there for 15 years, and I, I grew to really cherish and love that community and everything that you know it stands for. And um, I'm looking for another community to do that for the next 15 years. And I'm up in Newburyport right now, and I chose Newburyport specifically uh, with, with that same mindset. And um, unfortunately, I'm at a position where I'm looking elsewhere and, and really want to find a home uh, for the next 15 years. So a minute for the, a minute for the long run. Okay. So I'm Ed Barker. I'm the parent of a current second grader and the parent of an incoming kindergartner. Nice to meet you. One of the challenges that we've encountered is that it's been very difficult for Winbrook to articulate what the curricular objectives of each individual grade are and then how that fits into an overall arc across the time that a student would plan to be in this school, right? So that parents have a general sense for where is, the, where is this sure. target, where are we going, what are we trying to accomplish with our kids and what do we want them to have to be able to do to be able to accomplish when they, you know, when they get out, what's the What's the there that's there? Um, how would you, th how do you think about that one? And if that, if as I've characterized it as a fair characterization of what's going on here, how would you think about what you would want to do to address it and then communicate it to parents? I, I think it's a fair assessment of what it's like in a lot of districts, to be honest. That, <laughs> That vertical alignment piece, um, particularly in larger districts, but even in smaller districts, is is still prevalent. And you know, in Boston, was it was difficult to align across the district, but I did a ton of work aligning across the building, really making sense of where we wanted students at at the end of each academic year, so that they can have success the following at the following grade level. So we would bring. Um, multiple times over the course of the year, grade level teams from different grades together to have those conversations. So fifth grade teachers speaking to fourth grade teachers, sitting with copies of the Mass Massachusetts frameworks and saying, like, here are the power standards. This is, we, we know our curriculum. This is what we really need our students super strong in to have success the following year. And then those grade levels, fourth grade teachers going back to the table and looking at scope and sequence and saying, okay, where can we, where do we need to spend more time? Where can we spend a little less time? I found an incredible tool through Achieve the Core. It's called the Coherence Map. And it's, you know, it's particularly for math. But what it does is it maps every single mathematics standard all the way back to kindergarten. So you can clearly see standards that students are asked to, to reach mastery of in fifth grade, eighth grade, they can track all the way back to those foundational standards in kindergarten. So using that as a tool with staff to really you know, identify misconceptions and then look back to see, okay, wh where do we need to really get students to at the end of the year? And if we don't, where do we spend more time? How do we provide those types of interventions? Um, 
that's critical, critical work. And then in, in literacy, uh, I believe th there's an importance in a, uh, so, uh, let me backtrack. So in Boston, we went away from a basal curricula. Uh, we worked with our grade level teams and our instructional leadership, I use we purposefully because it was really our instructional leadership team, Jordan and I and um, some other staff members, worked with our grade level teams to develop units for literacy. Uh, they were gra absolutely grounded in, in texts, starting in third grade, core novels. So during that whole process, we really looked at you know, if a student was with us, we were a K through eight. So if a student was with us from third grade to eighth grade, what are they being exposed to over the course of their time with us? And making sure that we were, uh, you know, and not, I shouldn't say just our ILT, this is, our community was involved as well, but making sure that it was in alignment with what our core values were. And I think that's, you know, to answer your question, prior to any of that work happening at the topity top level, I think we need to collectively define what success looks like. What, what, do, we, what do we believe in? What are our core values as, as a community? And then make those decisions around what curricula we may be using so that it is vertically aligned in whether you're second grader, is it a second grader? Yeah, whether your second grader is in this classroom or this classroom, they may have different teachers, but they're being exposed to the same content. So that, that piece is critical, but the you know, those discussions about wh how we are defining what success of our students look like, whether that's at the high school level portrait of a graduate work or at the elementary level, like what are those foundational standards? What do we believe in? What are our core values? And then having those discussions about what is the most, uh, most appropriate curricula with the complexity uh, that is necessary to, to push students further. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah? Are, are sort of aware of what that is, aware yeah. of what that work has been done, and yep. how you plan to do it. Classic Winbrook move, the follow-up. <laughs> yeah, I love it, though. I love it because I forgot that piece, and it's critical. And I think it starts with having all of you at the table. Right? It's a community, it's a collective community decision on what our values are. And then it should be that the, the choosing of curricula uh, and the, the analysis of curricula should be a community decision as well. Um, and then in terms of, in, you know, we have new families, we have new students, we have new teachers, we have new community partners. Uh, those, those resources should be readily available online for, for community members to access. Um, yeah, there's, there, there are no surprises. Like what, you know, what uh, the content that we are teaching should be visible to, to everyone in the community to be able to reference. Um, for, for transparency purposes, but also to be able to support their students at home, right? Um, yeah, is that, so having those, you know, having it accessible, and then, you know, for, for those that are interested, potentially having um, a, a, a deeper conversation about the intricacies of the standards and, and what it all means, I, I think those conversations are fun to have with the community as well. Okay, so this kind of dovetails with that. Um, I'm Fizzy Cowing, I'm the current PTA president. I also worked here, I also went here, so. Whole, whole nine yards. Um, Full but circle. it's a collection, I have a collection of questions, I won't ask them all at once. Sure. Um, but the one that dovetails kind of most cleanly with what you were just talking about is, so if we're saying, you know, you wanna say no matter who your teacher is, you should end the year with this set of skills. So I guess the question is, um, how would you handle a situation in which a newer staff member, um, you were receiving feedback from parents that either A, the skills are not being met, or yeah. B, that there are kind of substantial problems with the, the, the match between the staff approach and yep. the actual um, developmental age of the kids? Sure. It's a great question because it's, you know, and I'm gonna say, no matter what I do, it's probably gonna happen, right? Because people are people. Uh, but I think that we can be super proactive in our approach to creating the condition so it doesn't. I, I think the first thing that comes to mind is creating time during the school day for grade level teams to work together, to sit and to 
to, to plan, to prepare, to look at student work, to have those conversations about what, what it means to be successful, right? To talk about instructional strategies that work, to, to, share, um, to share best practices. Those are, those are the best conversations in schools and they should be happening every single day. I've done a ton of work at rearranging schedules to allow for that time. And um, that time and some, right? I, uh, I, I'm, like I said at the beginning, we have uh, lots of responsibilities outside of school. All of you and all of our teachers. We, teachers have lives too, believe it or not. And it's, it's always been an emphasis of mine to be respectful of that and to build time within the school day for teachers to do the work that's required to do right for kids. So, you know, rearranging schedules, creating that time for those conversations. And then with, you know, with teachers, um, with new teachers in particular, making sure that they have a mentor, somebody, uh, not just a mentor that's assigned to them randomly, somebody that is part of their stakeholder group that is really going to show them the way and support them the way that they need. I was a new teacher once, it's not fun. And uh, I learned everything I learned about being a good teacher sitting with, sitting with other teachers, right? So uh, I would make sure that they had a mentor and make sure that those, those grade level team meetings were happening. And uh, you know, I'd, I'd spend a lot of time in classrooms, right? I encourage teachers to, I encourage teachers and parents to have those direct conversations with each other first right? Work out potentially any differences that you may have in terms of classroom environment or kind of the student learning that's happening with each other first. And then if and, if and when I need to get involved, that's totally fine because I, I, I'll be spending time in those classrooms. I'll have the evidence to have those conversations and I'm willing to you know, sit with you, sit with them, sit with you both and facilitate that conversation in a way that's respectful and, and and ultimately makes the conditions better for, for children, for kids. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm a parent of a current first and third grader. Um, I was curious what you thought. Um, you commented a few times on that, you know, we're all individual and we're people and we all have our certain skill sets. And, um, you know, I think about that a lot when I think about placement. I think all teachers bring certain specific skills to their classroom and to certain students and how you feel about uh, placement of students in class and how that should be done, if it should be done blindly or if there should be specific um, placements based on who the teacher is and who the student is and what role your teacher should play on that. It should definitely not be done blindly. I, it, Next question. <laughs> data, data is our superhero, right? Why, why would we not use it to our advantage to ensure the success of teachers and students. So I, we used in Boston, Aspen SIS. We use it up in Newburyport as well. It is not user friendly and the ability for even me at the access level that I have, the ability to, to get a, a, a portrait of an individual student or a group of students is almost impossible. It's just not accessible and it's worse for teachers. So I created on Google Sheets um, kind of my, own, my own system, uh, a way that the data is, is useful and is immediate and can be used to, to drive those class, competition, class composition conversations. Um, you know, we used last year a, uh, a program called Class Composer that looked at specific data points and arranging students. Um, I guess to keep the answer short, I, I and it's this very relevant question because these are the conversations that we're having right now, we're looking at placement for next year. It, that process is super, super important. I spend a ton of time with it. Uh, you know, from sitting with grade level teams with chart paper and sticky notes with kids and moving them around to looking at data online and moving it around. Um, I have a system for parent requests, right? I, I spend so much time, we spend so much time in that process that in the end, I feel entirely comfortable notifying parents who have um, 
feel differently about their child's placement, that it was done with, with their best interest in mind. And you know what? Nothing is permanent. You know, it, it's, it's, it's not great to start the year one spot and to you know, have to be moved to a different location at, in another point of the year. But if that's necessary and that's what it takes and we as a community agree that it's the best interest of the teacher, the student, the parent, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's have those conversations. But yeah, trust in the fact that I love that process and spend a lot of time thinking through it myself independently, but with teachers as well. Um, thanks. Hi, I'm Caitlin Madevu Matson. I am the mother of a second grader and a kindergartner, um, and I'm also on the Family Advisory Council for the after school group. Um, cool. And so I wanted to just ask um, what, if, if you've worked with any after school groups and kind of sharing space and kind of what you've seen as a strong relationship um, um, collaborating with those groups. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, in Boston, way more so than in Newburyport. I mean, we relied heavily on community partners, most of them for programming outside of school hours, whether it was before school or after school. So we, our YMCA program ran a program out of our cafeteria. Uh, I facilitated and, and coached for many years uh, a soccer program for elementary school students and middle school students. Our, our PE teachers ran intramural programs. Uh, our middle school teachers did some of the coolest stuff I've ever seen with, with STEM and robotics and uh, world language with our middle school students. So uh, I, believe, I believe in the power of, of opportunities uh, and those after school hours are critical times. And I think that uh, in Newburyport, we have the luxury that in the teacher contract, it requires teachers to spend one day a week after school uh, in directly supporting students. So this year we created our own after school program. Uh, staffed by, internally by our students, providing, uh, for those that need it, some, some intervention work, for those that are up to it, some acceleration work, and for others who are just interested in one thing or the other, like an opportunity to stay after school with their friends and, and teachers that care about some of the same things that they do and have fun. So uh, those programs are, are critical, uh, and then you know, in terms of collaborating and sharing space, just being open and honest and, and making sure that, you know, that communication is consistent uh, and that, I guess, looking, looking at what our visions are, right? what, what certain, and what service after school programs can provide to us and what services that we can provide to them and, uh, and, and building on that. It's, it's, it's an opportunity for our, for our students to continue to grow outside of school hours. So, you know, in my experience, I've worked with those programs to make sure that that time at, is, um, you know, fun, obviously, but also as, as productive as possible, if that's the right word, probably not, but uh, just time well spent. How about that? Yeah. Thank you. Is there a question here? Hi. Hi. My name is Lissa Bolatino. I'm the parent of a second grader. Could you please share with us um, the structures you put in place or how you support teachers to ensure that all students have access to what they need, meaning how do you ensure equity in education, mm -hmm. not only for those students who are struggling for any myriad of reasons to meet the standards at the end of the year, but also those students who have satisfied the, the standards when they walk in the door. So yeah. how, do you, how do you support teachers in challenging students and offering them what they need yeah. throughout the year, no matter where they are? It's a gigantic question. I feel like I could talk for the rest of the time about it. Um, I listened to a podcast on the way in earlier today, and I mentioned to the teachers earlier this afternoon, uh, they were talking about uh, learning being purposeful and not by chance, right? And I think that I, I was one of those students that needed purposeful instruction and didn't have, um, didn't necessarily have from outside of school, 
what it, what I needed to be successful. Um, so that that moves me, and and is definitely a big part of who I am and why I do what I do. Um, beyond that, I th I think that there are there are so many answers to your question that I would go back to time during the day to really plan effectively personalizing instruction for individual students. It go, it's connected to the, the class composition, you know, assigning students in cohorts where we can be efficient with the allocation of human capital resources, right? We can't, our special educators can't be spread out all over the place. Our service providers can't be running around wasting time in the hallways that they could be spending with students. Um, so there, there are so many keys to that uh, organizationally. Uh, and then at the classroom level, and, and the teachers asked me the question earlier about equity, you know, good teaching is good teaching. And I remember in Boston, we went through uh, a, tr a training with all of our staff called PSYOP, and taught teachers the, the, the top instructional strategies to promote language acquisition in classrooms. We had the highest percentage of English language learners in the entire district. And I, I just remember kind of reading through and thinking about and talking about those strategies. And yeah, they were focused on language acquisition, but those are great teaching strategies for all kids. You know, up in Newburyport, we, we worked with Landmark last year and continuing to do so this year to develop a language-based and a strategies-based program you know, uh, for our students that, for some of them, would have had to go actually to Landmark to get this, qual this, this opportunity. We didn't have the program previously. And th the, their approach, and you can Google it, it's online, they have six, their approach has six key points. It's high quality teaching. And it's good for all kids. It's not good. It's not just for kids with, with language disabilities. It's good for all kids. So, you know, really, for me, what has what where I have seen teachers really fly and soar and become you know better versions of themselves is when we empower them to get better, and we we you know continuously and collectively make the decision that. It's okay to make mistakes, and we're going to, we're, we're all learners. We're all learners. Um, you know, at the very finite level, and I'll, I'll finish by saying, students need access to uh, lots of things in the moment to be able to access the tasks that are being required to, to access in the classroom. Uh, and that starts in the planning process. So, whether it's a graphic organizer or a word wall or, you know, there was an eighth grade teacher at the McKay who at a previous school rewrote the book The Giver so that his students with disabilities could be able to access it to have group conversations with their grade level peers. So that, like, that, that added level of care and thought for, for those particular subgroups uh, is, is critical and a lot of the times I have found the things that we do for them so that they could be successful are good for all kids. They really are. Hi, my name is Ping Hui Wu. I am mother of a first grader and two future Winbrook kids. Uh, so my question is, as a principal, what will be your philosophy and strategies in terms of supporting kids with special needs, neurodivergent kids, and then to help them achieve their potential here. You've touched some of aspects yeah. of that, but yeah. um, just want to hear. Oh, yeah, okay. it's um, philosophy's hard, um, but I if I were to answer it, I would say I believe in the least restrictive setting. I believe in full inclusion. I believe that students should be sitting next to their grade level peers. Uh, not only sitting next to their grade level peers for as, you know, as much as they can, but having those scaffolds and supports and that the differentiated instruction that they need to be able to access the curriculum to be successful amongst, you know, alongside their grade level peers. So I think to do it effectively, it requires a system of student support where we are being super mindful 
of the tier one instruction for all students, tier two intervention work that's necessary for some students, and that tier three intervention work that is necessary for a few students. You know, we, we have limited resources, and we can do it, but we need to be efficient and smart about how we're doing so. So creating a system, it's a, it's a multi-tiered system of supports that um, where we are continuously assessing students academically, socially, emotionally, behaviorally, and tracking that data and using that data to our advantage in determining what those interventions are, on where on that tiered system of supports it, they lie, uh, and having the data that is necessary to sit at a special education team meeting, an IEP team meeting, and make the best decisions for least restrictive environments for, for students that have disabilities. I know Fitzy's got a whole list there. So I'm gonna give Fitzy the last question and I'm gonna ask you to just sort of wrap it up and maybe we have about maybe four minutes left. Okay, I have one that I really have to ask from another set of parents, but can I push back on that answer for one second? Yes. Okay, as a BCBA and a former moderate to severe special education teacher, I'm gonna push back and say, I believe in the LRE too, but how do you plan to manage behavior and discipline to keep the rest of the class safe when you have an instance where the push has been for full inclusion and that's not in fact the right decision? We need to, particularly with those students in implementing program, do it with fidelity and do it in a way where the data is tracked so that we can use it. Um, there, students should not be disrupting the learning experience for other students. Kids are kids and they're gonna make mistakes and we're gonna use those, those moments uh, as opportunities for those students to learn and grow. But there are also data points because if they continue to happen, then we need to have a conversation about what the least restrictive environment is. So uh, going back to the laws when they changed, it was about 10 years ago now, Mass General Law 222, we, we, the laws put a huge emphasis on keeping kids in school and keeping kids in the classroom. And I think what they've done is a little bit of a disservice to those students that come every single day and meet expectations. And you know, I was, I was in the middle, right? I was, there's no such thing as a bad kid. There's something going on also, right? But I was, I had a lot going on and I also wasn't learning, uh, but I didn't misbehave. You know, I just, I learned how to play school really well. And um, I, the least restrictive environment for me um, was, you know, general education classroom, uh, but there were students in those classrooms that over the course of time probably shouldn't have. So I think it, it for me, it's, it's about data. It's about being purposeful in our implementation of program, tracking the data honestly and effectively, whether that requires additional support. We have, we have paraprofessionals aligned to our, we have an IDC program aligned to our IDC staff that are constantly take, you know, carrying the binder and the clipboard and um, we work very, very closely with our BCBA to um, <laughs> like word for word follow program that's provided through students IEPs because we need the data to be able to sit at the table and to have those conversations if they're disrupting the learning environment continues for other kids. That's not fair. Thank you. Um, so this is the question that was asked by several, so this was asked by several parents um, and it's kind of a two-parter but it, it's all related to each other. Um, what can parents and students expect from you in an average week? And like, we all understand the job can get crazy. An MCAS week, nobody's gonna see you because you're gonna be crazy or Oh, they'll whatever. see me. But, well, so the point is, what can parents expect from you in terms of FaceTime on a weekly basis? And what will students expect from you on a weekly basis in terms of FaceTime? I hope you, you enjoy my face and they do too because you'll see a lot of it. I'm, I'm, Paper works for before school and after school and people works for during the school day. And I am constantly out and about. Um, it, it's in, 
not because I have to be, but because I want to. Uh, it's where I find the most joy, and I, I think it's, it's led me to, be, to have the success that I've had as a school leader. Um, like I said, I'm not a narrative guy, and so the only way that I'm going to show you that I care about you and that I trust you and I'm going to support you is to be out there and do it. And you know, I'm willing to, to pick up a mop or a broom if I need to, right? Um, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. So I'm, I'm constantly out there. Uh, I love, I ride the bus in the morning and the afternoon with kids. Uh, I'm always, you know, after when I get off, I'm standing at the line, the drop off line, and co having conversations with families as they drop students off. That's the best part of the job. Uh, you know, I, if I wanted to sit and lock myself in an office and, um, you know, look at, look at data presentations and, and Excel documents, I, I wouldn't be in this business. Uh, this is, it's a relationship business. It's, it's a dynamic relationship business. And I can't, it, it can't happen sitting, sitting in four walls of an office. So this is, here's the face. Hope you, hope you like it. Okay, and the follow-up you know, the office work is, what is a reasonable amount of time between a parent or member of the PTA reaching out either via phone or email and receiving a response? We all know it's not like 24 hours, like nobody's asking. Yeah, you that, I mean, I, I hate. What is it in your view? I, 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 don't wanna, I don't wanna make a hard, fast rule right now, right? But it's, if a community member, whether it's a parent or somebody else is, Taking time to try to communicate something to me, that's important. And it's important that I reply. So um, as fast as possible. But what I like to tell teachers, like, our job is, and their job, is crazy. And, and our job as parents is crazy. And every now, you know, we have priorities that jump to the, the front of our mind that is number one on our list right now in the grand scheme of my world or the teacher's world or it, it may not be top priority. So just kind of understanding that, you know, I wanna hear it, I wanna address it, it's super important, but there's a lot going on, yeah. Michael, give you last, uh, maybe, Thirty seconds, and Sid, and Sid gave you a couple of follow-ups. No, give, if you give us just thirty seconds, uh, just about kind of making your final, your final point. I wish I had more time. I'd read you my uh, my, <laughs> my chat GPT script. Um, I love what I do. I, I really do. I'm passionate. I, I hope that's that's clear uh, through my presentation, through my you know, answering the questions. Uh, am I perfect? No, um, but none of us are, and. So if, I think as a community, if you're looking at somebody that's going to be a gigantic proponent of, of, of you and your kids and advocate for them and a supporter of high quality teaching and learning and of teachers getting better every single day, then I'm your guy. And uh, you know, I'm persistent, I'm resilient, uh, I'm sometimes maybe a little ferocious, uh, but that's just, that's what I feel, I feel it takes to, to do what I do to the best of my ability and what it takes for teachers to have what they need to just be incredible. Um, you know, I strive for excellence. And you know, this, this building in particular is really close to excellent. I mean, top 90th percentile of schools in the Commonwealth, like, let's be 100. We could do it. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Thank you all. So it is my pleasure to present uh, Elana Bebchik. Um, Elana is currently serving, uh, and actually there's a couple mistakes in here that you're going to fix. So I will. I, I miscalculated on your resume. So I'm going to read what I wrote and she'll figure out whatever I got wrong. So Elana is currently serving the role of principal at the Clark Elementary School in the Swampscott Public Schools, a position she's held since 2017. Prior to that, she worked as a principal at Hadley Elementary School, also in Swampscott. From 2013 to 16, she served as principal at the Liberty Elementary School and as a member of the Braintree Public Schools. She brings prior building leadership experience as a head of school and an assistant principal in, uh, assistant principal in schools in the Seattle, Washington area. Her classroom experience spans 11 years in four grades, including grades one, two, three as a bilingual educator in the Chelsea Public Schools for four years, and grade four in the Newton Public Schools for eight years. 
She cites instructional leadership, building partnerships with families, and fostering inclusiveness and a respect for differences among her areas of expertise. She brings a BA in Spanish from Tufts University and an ADM from Boston University in elementary and bilingual education. So Alana, we're thrilled to have you here. I'm sure I got some of that wrong. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to just introduce yourself and a little bit about your resume for, for a couple minutes. Okay. And then we have a few questions to sling at you. Okay, so he was mostly right. Um, in Seattle, I was an assistant head of school. My job was to supervise everything related to teaching and learning. So pretty comparable to a principal role um, while the head of school was having to work on you know, business operations and fundraising. Um, and then I was actually at the Hadley School for five years in Swampscott. And then the superintendent asked me to move over to Clark this year. Uh, because 25% of students at Clark receive ELL instruction, and I do have that background in bilingual education, working with second language learners, and so um, that's been really a wonderful place to be this year. Uh, so yeah, I've had, I really feel very fortunate uh, to have had a very rich career as an elementary educator. I did teach, I had my own you know, classroom teacher for my first 11 years, and those years I worked in Chelsea and in Newton, I worked with kind of the range of learners. And those years have been so important as a school leader, as a principal, because I really have a strong understanding of best teaching practice. So it helps me every single day, whether I'm in a classroom, um, you know, doing an observation of a teacher, whether I'm involved with hiring, and most importantly, helping to support lots of different students with different needs. Then I moved into administration. Um, my husband took us out to Seattle and got some ex great experiences out there and then came back and this is my ninth year as a public school principal in Massachusetts. I really enjoy being a principal. I find the work to be very rewarding because I see that I can make a difference and have a larger impact than I did in the past. So whether hiring an excellent teacher, seeing students thriving in that teacher's classroom, uh, working with my staff on fostering a more positive school climate and then seeing behaviors, kind of behavior incidents decrease, um, or working closely with the PTA to plan community events that become really inclusive and get to engage the whole community. Those are just some examples, but I just find the work to be very, very rewarding. And I've been enjoying my time in Swampscott. I've been there for a number of years. Um, it's been a great fit for me, and at the same time, I want to continue learning and growing and pursuing new opportunities. So when I saw the Winbrook position posted, I was excited. Belmont is an excellent school district. And then as I've been in the hiring process, learning about the school, my excitement has grown. Um, as you know, it's a very high-performing school, but I've also learned that many of the teachers have been here for years, which really speaks to the strength of the community. I also see how active the PTA is and how there's a lot of family involvement, and it just seems like a very vibrant community where children love being here, teachers love being here, and families are involved. And I'm just excited, very excited about this opportunity. I feel like I'll be able to bring all of my skills and experiences here and help the whole school continue to be successful. So looking forward to answering your questions, and thank you for having me. Questions? We can either do the same ones or you can do different ones. It's, it's, it's really up to you. Hi, good evening. My name Hi. is Erica Roberts. I've got a second grader here, and I also have an older son who went K through fourth here. So I have uh, experienced over two different principles, and I know I'm on my way out, but I just I kind of think I might have some ideas yeah, of, of what worked and what didn't. Yeah. Um, one of the hats that I wear currently um, is a co-president uh, of the PTA, and I'm so glad you mentioned it in your opening, and also a co-chair of Safe Routes to School, which you may have worked with through Massachusetts Department of Transportation. Mm -hmm. Could you give me some examples of what you actually do when you're working with those kind of stakeholders or sure. and how you might like to do that if you were here. Absolutely. So I love, um, first of all, I just love working with families in general and really love partnering with the Parent Teacher Association and also with the school council. I found that group is, that advisory group is very um, helpful. So with the PTA, in the past, um, I've had standing meetings with the PTA or PTO boards, and that really depends on the preference of the board. Um, I've met as often as every two weeks. Um, my current PTA uh, board, they're very busy, so they said they just want to meet monthly. Um, so I just think good communication is really important so that we can meet regularly, find out you know, what initiatives uh, PTA wants to work on, what support is needed at the school, and how we can work together to make that happen. I typically, I like to um, send out regular communication to families. Um, it's often been weekly, like on a Friday I send out an email um, with important reminders and I always put important dates at the bottom, um, announcements. And so in the past the PTA would send me a blurb 
it, and I would just, I would pop that right into my weekly email, but also as things come up, like if there's a special event, like I know you had a multicultural, oh, okay. <laughs> If you, you had a multicultural night last week, or might, there might be a sign up to sign up to volunteer for the book fair, um, we'll send the, you know, the administrative assistant will send those reminders out um, throughout the week when, when needed. Um, so yeah, I just think regular meeting, regular communication and planning and sharing our ideas. Um, often, you know, PTAs and, and other families have amazing ideas and they're like, we'd like to try this. And, and, and so I just love to make those things happen. Um, and I know fundraising is a big part of what PTAs do. So anything that I can do to support what you're, you know, kind of really understanding what you want to accomplish, and then whatever I can do to support that, and you know, working with the teachers too. So it might be that, um, you know, you really want to, you really want. There's a fundraiser, but we really need teachers on board. So getting their input on those kinds of things. Um, and then I just did want to say that when I come into a new principal role, I have an entry plan, and that allows me to get to know the school community, the culture of the school, and I have individual meetings with staff. I meet with the school council, the PTA board, but I also hold parent coffees, and I like to start in the summer. Um, also, coming into this new role, I would love to talk with the PTA about how I can get to know families. So maybe we do some meet and greets or um, summer picnics. Um, we'll do parent coffees into the fall. And I, I ask the same questions. It's, um, you know, I want to get to know people. So tell me a little bit about yourself so I can get to know you. What do you most value about Winbrook Elementary that you hope to preserve? What do you feel needs my immediate attention and what changes might be necessary? And how do you envision me best supporting you? And what happens is common themes start to er emerge. And then we can, I share that data with each of the groups and then we can talk about, okay, well, how, what are we going to do? So anyway, I look forward to working with the Winbrook PTA, hopefully. <laughs> Any questions? This is Don, if you all don't. Oh, no. Okay. Go ahead. I'll go. I'm going to here, here, and then to the back. Hi, my name is Carolyn Gaffey. I have a third grader here. Okay. Um, so I guess I just want to know a little bit more about you and your approach, and, how, and um, I, I think Happy teachers make happy kids. Happy kids make happy parents. So how do you plan to foster that here? Um, like, wh what are you envisioning for your, your first year at Winbrook? What would you be doing in terms of um, your, your new base yeah. and everything yeah. here? So I think really the most important thing that I would need to do in any new role is to, to develop caring and trusting relationships. Right, like that's fundamental to, to being a successful leader. I have found the entry process that I was just describing really, really helpful. I invite teachers to come in in the summer and I start, ha and not only teachers, all staff members. I start having those meetings, really starting to get to know people on a personal level, hear what they love about the school and how I can best support them. And that, as I said, th themes start to emerge and then that helps me to see you know, what direction I need to go in. I do feel it's really important coming into a new school, and especially this is a very successful school, to really respect and honor what's in place. And um, I've, I've learned that. You need to come in, um, really get to know, become familiar with the, the, how things run, with the culture, and make changes gingerly, <laughs> like go slowly with changes. But that being said, sometimes changes have to be, make, be made. If there's a safety concern, if there's something related to equity, um, things that need to be addressed, those things need to be addressed. You know, in working with teachers specifically, I, and just with everyone, actually, in terms of, of fostering these trusting and positive relationships, I think certain things are very important. One is being a good, first of all, being present and being available. So my door is always open unless I'm having a confidential meeting or a confidential phone conversation. Um, I like to be, at, like, throughout the school. I love to be in classrooms. I get to know the kids. I get to see the curriculum. I get to see these amazing teachers and all of their talents. And then, like, I love to use staff meetings as opportunities for, sh for teachers to share best practice. Um, so, th so just being veiled. I love, I don't know how drop-off works here, but currently it's a rolling drop-off. I'm opening car doors. It's a great way to start my day, you know, saying good morning to families, to dogs, um, to babysitters, just to everyone. Um, being outside at recess, being in the cafeteria, just knowing that like I'm present means that I'm available to people. Um, and then I just, I really try to listen and listen with empathy. Um, 
I try to follow through on what I say I'm going to do in a timely manner. I'm, I'm really organized, so that's important to me. Um, maintaining confidentiality is really important. Uh, being able to offer solutions. Like I, may not, I might not have the answer, but I'm going to find out and talk to people in the district or talk to other members of the community so I can solve things. Uh, because, you know, teaching is a big lift, and so teachers need, they need to have their materials, they need to have a um, well-functioning building, they need to have resources, and I also will advocate for those if I see that those are needed. Um, I think showing appreciation is really important, and um, just finding different ways to show teachers appreciation, and also, I've, I've said, and I said this to teachers this afternoon, you know, health and family have to come first. And teachers are really hard on themselves and they don't want to miss school. And, you know, they'll be like, well, they come in, they're not really feeling well. Oh, but it, you know, it's really hard to, to, to do sub plans as an elementary teacher. But it's like, no, you have to take care of yourself. Um, and I'm, I try to be really accessible. So everyone has my cell phone number. I say, call me at any, t call or text at any time. Um, my phone has quiet hours. So you don't have to worry about waking me. But I just try to be really responsive to everyone. Um, to parents, guardians, um, and <coughs> caregivers. So I hope that answered it. Okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to ask the same question I asked before. Um, I'm curious about what your thoughts are and your how you feel that placement should be made from year to year and what you think the role of individual teachers are, uh, the ultimate role of the principal in finalizing that classroom, and if you feel that blind placement in any way of either the class that students that are put together or with the teacher or have a role in the development of classrooms okay um, so I've been doing class placement for a long time and I have a process that I really think works well so what happens is typically right after April vacation sort of end of April early May I send out a letter to parents and guardians letting them know that we'll soon be starting our class placement process and kind of outlining you know that we're going to work to create balanced groups and all the things that we're looking at, which is, you know, we, it's really important to have balance, as balanced as possible classes in terms of academics, learning needs, but also socially and emotionally. Um, and social dynamics is a key factor. So some students work really well together and some students do not work well together and they distract one another. So I kind of outline the process and invite um, parents and guardians to send me an email if they have any information to share about their child that would be helpful in our process. Um, so I get those emails and I tuck them all into a folder and I share pertinent information with the teachers. Um, then what I've done in the past, that, like we, we developed this at Hadley and I've just actually shared this with the Clark staff. It's a visual template by grade level where we, and, and I don't believe in a blind process. Um, we have the teachers' names on, at the top of the, at each column on the spreadsheet um, and we're trying to create this balanced group. So we have different codes. And so usually um, we start with our special educators because we have students who get inclusion support. So that means they need to have an aide supporting them. Um, and so, you know, or um, students based on what, um, their, what their IEP goals are, they might need to be placed, you know, like if, if three students in the grade are getting what's called push-in writing support. So the special educator comes into the classroom three times a week for 30 minutes to provide writing support. It might be hard if those students were in separate classrooms, so easier for them to be placed together. So the special educators start and place the students, and then um, typically I'll have the ELL teachers place students, and then the um, general ed classroom teachers will place other students. And one thing that I'm, I really want, and, and is this, okay, well, I really want everyone to be very cognizant of what I call teacher time, just to make sure that the groups are balanced. So, because some students are going, you know, if you have a newcomer, if you have a um, student who just arrived from another country, they're getting ELL services, but that's not the entire school day, right? They might be getting those services for an hour, an hour and a half a day, but then they're in the classroom and they're going to need more support. So, I just want to be really cognizant um, of the of the needs of each group to have them be as balanced as possible. And I really do trust the teachers. They know their colleagues and they know, um, you know, certain students are going to do really well with certain, te certain teachers. And, um, you know, the other piece I want to say about that, once the teachers, oh, and so then I meet with um, the grade level teachers and all of the academic interventionists. And we look very, very closely. And I have all the notes from the parents and I double and triple check it. And we talk through and, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a process, and sometimes I've had to reconvene that group kind of at the end of the school year, and sometimes um, a new student will move, well, t t kids often will move in over the summer. The reason I like the template, because it's very visual, and I can 
you know, if let's say a student comes in with an IEP, I can see like where they might be best placed. Um, but sometimes I have to call the teachers back because I can't just start, I can't just start kind of moving kids around because the teachers know those students in intimately. So I've asked in the summer teachers to come back so we can discuss this. Yeah. Um, well, I would have to find out kind of a rationale as to why, and there might be some really important reasons, um, but I can just speak about my own experience that I have not done pl blind placement, and I, now sometimes, for example, right now we have a third grade teacher who's retiring, so that's TBD on the spreadsheet, um, although we're about to hire someone, um, but sometimes we go into the summer and we don't know. And so we have to just do the best. And even with all the effort that goes into class placement, sometimes, you know, a student will move out, a new student will move in, and everything can kind of get thrown off, but we do our best. Yeah. Uh, good evening. I'm going to try to ask this question the same way I did last time. <laughs> um, I, I have a kindergartner, rising, rising kindergartner, and uh, currently, so I have, currently have a second grader and a preschooler um, rising to uh, third grade and kindergarten. Okay. Um, one of the challenges here in the past has been the difficulty in articulating the objectives for students within each grade and then being able to articulate that as, an, as a learning arc across the school. So how the activities of one grade set kids up for the next grade and, and, and how that, and then being able to explain and articulate that well to families to understand sort of where kids are, where they should be and why that's part of the part of the process okay. um, how would you think about that and then how would you go about sort of addressing uh, articulating that and explaining that to parents in a way that okay. helps understand sort of where kids are where they should be and why certain things are happening yeah so there's um, kind of fundamentally there's um, benchmark there's uh, it, the state puts out benchmarks you know, what they want students to be able to learn um, and achieve at every grade level. So there's English language arts benchmarks and math benchmarks and social studies benchmarks and science benchmarks. So um, that is used, um, that's kind of the basis from which the curriculum it comes. And there are, uh, like for example, math, there's a lot of different math programs out there that are aligned with math standards, but they don't always align perfectly. Um, and at every grade level there may be gaps, you know, maybe, um, the curriculum is really strong in most areas, but let's say for geometry, it's weak. It's broken down by kind of units and then lessons, how students are going to attain the different skills that hit the benchmarks. So if there was some confusion around that, I mean, I would have to start by getting to know how things operate in the district, um, working with the curriculum di director to get a better understanding, working with the teachers here. I think, again, being in classrooms is really, really helpful because I get to see the curriculum in action. Um, some of the you know best practices I'm already familiar with. Um, for example, I don't. I was looking on the school improvement plan, and um, it was, or and there was a, something on the web, website about the second step curriculum. This is a social emotional learning curriculum. I'm familiar with second step, um, for example, um, but there may be some um, programs that I haven't used. So really, I need to get a good understanding. But then. Um, if this is an area that parents and families want more information, I would say let's plan an evening uh, forum um, where we can have, we can really kind of give an overview. Um, maybe we could have some teachers who could come and help assist. Maybe that's something I could run with the curriculum director for the district um, so that it does make sense. And uh, probably having some kind of mapping, you know, like these are the skills um, in kindergarten and that's how it builds into first grade. Because that is really important, because you want to be able to support your children, right? So if you need to understand. And I know for years, um, mathematics instruction has been really hard for a lot of parents to understand, because it's so different than the way many of us were taught. And so then parents feel frustrated, because they want to help their children, and they're not sure how. So um, I think getting that feedback just would be really helpful. And, Over here, and then I'll come back. Uh, my name's Alex Danahy. I have a kindergartner, um, and then I have a daughter who went here who's now in fifth grade, and three older children. And I also went to Winbrook. <laughs> you went to Winbrook, too. Um, wow. Yes, and then I serve on the um, school improvement 
commit as a, a parent rep. Oh, great. Um, but I have a question. Yeah. You know, in the past couple years have been a, for our whole country, the whole world has been one of change and transition. And I was going to ask you a question about your experience with change and transition, where in this community, we just, we had a principal for a long time, then we had a principal just for three years. We now have the fourth grade moving to the mm -hmm. middle school. So there's a lot of moving pieces, and I just wanted to hear about your thoughts on that or your experience dealing with transitions. Yeah. So I've gone through a lot of transitions. <laughs> um, you know, I thought that I was managing a big transition prior to COVID when we did the, Swampscott did some redistricting. And so some students from the Stanley School came over to Hadley and some kids from Hadley had to move over to Clark. And um, there was a lot of anxiety and upset about that, of course. So my, my approach with that was just, you know, we had a, in, in the spring before this transition happened, we had families and kids come for an orientation and a tour and we just you know wanted to, wanted to be as welcoming as, and as helpful as possible and I just knew like after they've been here for a few weeks in September they're going to be fine because it's a great school great teachers and that was true um, there was so then we the pandemic hit and that was an incredibly challenging for all of us um, and so I think like you know when I reflect on that and leading my school community through that um, I think like the skills that, that come to mind for me were problem solving um, and communication and collaboration. So you know the Hadley School was built in 1911, and thankfully Swampscott is in the process of building a new elementary school um, that should be ready within the next year or two. Um, but you know 1911 building, completely substandard, very small classrooms, very small cafeteria. The largest room in the school is the gym. It was the most poorly ventilated, so they had to go through like a year-long project to replace the HVAC system. Um, so many problems with that building, ventilation, heating, leaks, I just could go on and on. Um, and so then I was charged with, okay, I have to create a um, reopening plan for hybrid instruction. So that was, let's get a committee together. We had teacher rep representation, parent representation, and a lot of problem solving. You know, how are we going to enter and exit and have snack and sanitize and quarantine if someone becomes sick during the school day? How are we going to do that in this very limited space? So there was just a lot of input from people and then decision making that I had to do. I had to create a whole reentry plan. And I think part of it was just communication, like sharing that out with families. What questions do you have? Sharing that out with staff. What questions do you have? Um, one thing that I found really helpful, I, I did not have an in-person staff meeting for three years. So I got really adept at Zoom meetings. And we even did um, all school assemblies on Zoom. It's amazing what, how you can actually engage with kids because you know, I, could, I could call on children in the different classrooms. But um, you know, it was re what was really hard for the teachers was for everyone was the Department of Education had guidance. So they handed down guidance. OK, this is phase one. This is everything that you need to do to, you know, that you need to implement as educators for the kids. And it was a lot. And I was on the committee at the district level working on the remote learning plans. So we would get everything into place. Things would be humming along. And then about six weeks later, Desi would come out, oh, here's some new guidance. So people were getting very, very stressed. So what I would do with the staff is I would create a, a do shared document. Please put all of your questions and concerns into this document a few days before our staff meeting. I would answer anything that I had answers to. If I didn't, I would be you know, in touch with the director of student services or the facilities director um, or the PTO you know, to try to get answers. And then at the staff meeting, I would, you know, we would go through. You know, like These are my answers. And there's some things I can't solve. I don't know right now. Like, I'm not sure how kids are going to you know, hand sanitize and get their mask on. And what do you guys think? And then we would just problem solve. And often things were solved. Um, and then I did offer every week um, on Zoom just a check-in time, like kind of office hours. Anyone could log in with any questions or concerns that they had. And sometimes two people came and sometimes 10 people came. But I just wanted to keep, you know, because we weren't in person, just, just be very available and present. Um, so I think I know that I have been through a lot of changes. And I know that that is hard. And I think just being present for people, communicating effectively, listening, really listening and hearing what people's thoughts are, taking feedback. And again, I found in terms of change efforts, my most, the most successful change efforts are collaborative, when different people can weigh in and we can work together. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. I'm Caitlin Madevu-Matson. I um, am the parent of a 
kindergartner and a second grader, and I'm also on the Family Advisory Council of the After School Group here. Okay. Um, and so my question is, is um, what has your experience been working with um, after school groups and other groups trying to use the space and, and collaborate, um, and, and how has that worked well for you? Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so currently at Clark, and this was at Hadley too, uh, we had YMCA is an after school program that's on site. So they're using the gym and the outdoor play space, and sometimes they have to use classrooms. I know at Hadley they did have to use classrooms. Um, and then we also have a PTA sponsored after school program where kids can have, you know, Lego Club or um, slime, I don't know what it's called, slime, there's a special name for the slime, or sewing classes, or, and so um, I think that those programs, I mean, first of all, aftercare is so important for working families, and then the PTA enrichment programs are such a great opportunity, and children love them. So I would, you know, just work with the custodians um, to make sure that we have everything that we need, and also um, with teachers, like the space. So, um, you know, we've asked teachers, We've said we have to use your classroom space, and it's not ideal, but we just really try to be respectful, and the um, people running the programs, respectful of the kids not touching certain things. Sometimes we've had added materials, so you know, the kids are gonna need their craft materials. And so we've asked if those come in. Um, there have been a few occasions when things were touched, and then we, I mean, address those things right away. Um, right now, we're actually using the staff room for some of the ASP programming. Um, the, it was great because there's a sink in there, and that way, Teachers weren't, their space wasn't being used. But I've, I've, I've had to do that um, on numerous occasions. And it's fine. Um, the other thing is in working, um, especially with the Y, there have been behavior issues um, that have come up at the Y that then, you know, she, the coordinator and I work very closely together. If there's a behavior issue outside of school, it could be on the playground. Um, in Braintree, it happened a lot on the bus. It could happen in the after school program. You know, even though that's not happening under the school's watch, those issues and conflicts are coming right back to school the next day. So just making sure that we collaborate a lot and are knowing you know, what's happening and just so we can best support the students. If there's students who require, um, who are on IEPs who re require specialized support for after school programs, then those are provided and um, work with the di Director of Student Services to ensure that that's in place. Uh, hi. hi. My name is Lissa Bolatino. I'm the parent of a second grader. Okay. I also had an older child who's going to ninth grade next year. Um, he, well, you've already touched on this t in many of your other answers, but I wondered if you could speak directly about your approach to ensuring equity and education for all students. So what structures do you put in place? How do you ensure that teachers have the supports they need in order to meet the needs of all students so that students the populations you've been speaking of who for a variety of reasons um, may need support to meet the standards mm -hmm. by the end of the year, um, but also those students who have met the standards prior to even entering the classroom. You know, they've met all second grade standards before they've, in math, before they've even darkened the door of their second grade classroom. Yeah, okay. Um, let me talk first about um, supporting kids with who might be not at grade level or who need additional supports. Um, so I do work closely with special ed teams wherever I am principal. I also attend IEP meetings, initial IEP meetings and three-year reevaluations. I try to attend all of those. The, the review meetings I may not attend. As those are the ones that are annual. Um, I have uh, brought a data team process to um, in my work, um, which is essentially um, twice a year, all of the academic interventionists meet with every classroom teacher to identify any students who are not making effective progress. And it's both academic and socially and emotionally. So, because um, I wanna make sure that no child falls through the cracks and that all, um, that students are getting the, the appropriate support. Um, so we discuss, you know, the child's needs, what might have been tried already, um, and then we really, like an, um, a student support team is a group that meets regularly, students are referred, the teachers already tried various accommodations and needs more support, sort of like a brainstorming group. Um, but this is basically a school-wide SST where we talk about with each classroom teacher. So 
you know, what's been tried, um, what more, kind of brainstorm, what are some action plans? What are we going to put in place? Maybe the child is new this year and really hasn't made friends and is feeling a little sad, so that child's going to join a lunch group with the school counselor. Um, maybe the child is, like the, the benchmark assessments show that they're kind of on the cusp of with reading, needing a little more support, so the literacy specialist is going to add that child to their group. Um, maybe it's a child that's doing okay, but we just need to keep our radar on that child, and we're going to check back again. And I've done those, those school-wide SST data meetings usually in November and then in March, and we keep notes, um, and we refer to those notes regularly to make sure we're following up on our action plans, and then we revisit. So um, that's one vehicle I've used to make sure that we're addressing, that no one's falling through the cracks. And I think um, the other point that you made is very valid because we don't want to have, you know, there's some children that are, let's say, in math. They already know the concept. And so there's no point for them to be sitting through the whole group instruction and, you know, like we, we need to foster, we need to build their skills and, um, and challenge. You know, because, I mean, high expectations is one of the, core values of the school and it's really, really important and everyone needs to be pushed to reach their full potential. So I think in that regard it's really working with um, teachers on how to best differentiate and meet those um, kind of range of needs. And I think math is harder to differentiate than English language arts. Um, so it would be, you know, me getting to know the curriculum and being in classrooms and really having those conversations, those follow-up follow -up conversations and talking about it at staff meetings, but that is really important too. Um, and I just, I want to make sure that I do talk tonight, so I don't know if someone had a question, just about hiring, so maybe, because that's yeah, related. I was going to give you the last, the last word, so we'll let you. Okay, but I, I, so who else has questions? Yeah. We, we only have about two minutes left, so I just okay. want to make sure. Okay, so it, you can have a very short answer. So Winburg is a very diverse community in terms of language, culture, backgrounds. I, I, I was wondering what your thought on how to support kids from diverse family background to feel like their diversity is an asset instead of what's yeah. like pushing yeah. them down, down and also how to involve parents of different language and cultural background into the school activities and then all the... Yeah, so that's more than it may be a two minute question. So can I answer that and then can, can I talk about hiring? Yep. <laughs> okay. So um, it's really important to me that every child feels celebrated for who they are, for their background, where they're from, the language they speak, the religion, everything they bring. They're, you know, it, it's really important. Every child needs to feel safe. Um, safety is paramount. Um, kids can't learn if they don't feel safe. And so um, I, it's important for me to foster an environment where kids feel like where it's joyful and it's nurturing and kids feel celebrated. So I think um, this, the school right now is working on a lot of initiatives around cultural proficiency, which I'm really happy about because I think that is so important. And they've also been engaging in some professional development to understand kind of the foundation, kind of the systems that are in place right now which promote racism and bias. Um, so I think that that's just really something innovative about Belmont that I was very excited about. So I think it starts at the classroom level, you know, where um, every child, where the teachers can um, have lessons and projects that celebrate each child. So maybe they're working on family heritage projects, or they're, they're doing oral history projects with families, um, or they're writing, um, I did this with my fourth graders, I am from poems. Um, the, the classroom libraries, I want every child to see characters and books that they feel they connect with. And I know that that's being worked on and also mentor text. So that's also a goal of this school in the library. And then I think it's very important to look at the curriculum and how do you weave to topics of diversity with the existing curriculum. Historically, there's been a lot of history that's been misrepresented, underrepresented, or just missing. So again, that talks to the cultural proficiency that the district and school is working on. I also think it's really important to have um, at the school level to celebrate the richness of the community and whether it's through enrichment um, programs and performances of diverse, diverse um, artists um, or just get coming together to celebrate, you know, maybe it's, um, you know, at an assembly you're learning about kindness and I read a story and it's from a diverse author, just really promoting that school-wide. I know you had a multicultural family celebration last week, so that was um, great to see. But I know, like from my own experience working with um, families who are second language learners, who come from other countries, there is kind of an immediate barrier that can be created when um, families don't speak English as their first language. They didn't go to school here. They are not familiar with the culture. So I think it's really important to plan, to really be thinking about inclusive events 
number one. So for example, at Liberty and at Hadley, um, when I got there, some of the biggest events were fundraisers, and there was a whole segment of the school community that was not coming to these events. So I talked with the PTA and I said, can we please have a free event? And they said, sure, let's do a bingo night. And we'll get, you know, and then a free ice cream was donated. And then all of a sudden, we had diverse representation. So I think it's really important to be thinking about um, how to be inclusive. And also, outreach, like if, if there's room parents here, um, I would, I, you know, something that I think has been successful is also parents who speak certain languages can also be reaching out and inviting parents because you know, if, if you get a call and say, I'd love you to come to the, you know, to the skate night and do you need a ride or I'll pick you up, or, like, people feel more comfortable when they have that personal connection. So I think um, looking for ways to really reach out and include the community is important. All right, I'll give you the last, okay. last minute or so. No, I just wanted to talk about hiring because I feel like as a principal it's the most important thing I do and um, it kind of speaks to some of the things that people were asking tonight. And I do feel um, proud of a process that I've developed over the years. It's really rigorous, but it's been very successful. And so there's always a team, um, a school-based hiring committee. Um, we meet and we talk about, and, and on, like right now we have a third grade opening. So I wanted other third, the other third grade teachers, other specialists, so having kind of diverse representation on there. Um, and then we make our wish list. If we could hire the perfect candidate, what are all the attributes and qualifications that they would have? So we develop that list, and then um, we develop interview questions based on that list. And then I do the paper screening, and I'm really picky. <laughs> you know, any typos or grammatical errors, or you didn't have the full complete application, sorry. Um, and I also like to hire people with experience whenever possible, because I know, I mean, I think I was a good teacher my first year, but not an excellent teacher. Um, and then I always have, I you know, try to get at least, you know, six or seven initial interviews, but I always have a almost always have a finalist process because for me it's really important to see candidates with kids. So they have to teach a demonstration lesson and I just I leave it kind of open, you know, 45 minutes. Um, it can be ELA or math. Um, I want to see what they're going to bring without a lot of direction for me. Um, so we, we watch the lesson. We have a second interview where the first question is please reflect on the lesson that you just taught, which is always a very informative question. Um, then I, st I bring snacks and step away and let the team just kind of chat without any set questions because I want to make sure it's a good fit. Um, I give people a writing prompt and then I do my reference checking. So um, I just wanted to share that because I can tell that the school has excellent educators who've been here for a long time, which has made the school successful, and that's something that I would look forward to continuing. Excellent. Alana, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you very much. Hope to see you this summer.